Okay, everybody, welcome back to class. This is a somewhat different lecture than the ones we've had before. It's um, more sort of content oriented and less tools oriented. I want to talk uh, a little bit about um, how we ought to think about the web, uh, but I want to place it in a historical context using uh, concepts that have become important or uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, <clears throat> so the main thing we're going to do today is talk about the concept of the public sphere as it was put forward by uh, the philosopher and historian Jürgen Habermas in the 1960s and 70s, uh, and then the interpretation of that idea in light of changes in our contemporary media and information transfer system. This is kind of longer than I want it to be, so I'm going to rush through it as fast as I can, and I hope that um, you will stop and replay if it goes too fast for you. Um, okay, here we go. Um, uh, so the title of the um, of the lecture, What the Web Signifies, is kind of a pun. These are two things, significance and signification. What matters about the web? How is it significant? And how does the web create and change meaning? How does the web signify, as it were? Um, uh, so what matters about the web? Well, the web has had all kinds of effects on all kinds of parts of our lives. Economic effects, political effects, cultural effects. What I want to talk about today, though, are its discursive effects. That is, how the web changes the kinds of conversations that we can have uh, for better or for worse. Uh, you might also hear me talk about the peculiar technical affordances of our technological system. Every technology makes some things easier and some things harder. So, for instance, a, uh, a piece of chalk, a pencil, and a pen all have similar uses but distinct technological affordances. They make some things easier and some things harder. And that's also true about, say, a jigsaw and a circular saw when you're doing carpentry work, uh, or a rocking chair and a stool. Okay, let's talk about the public sphere. Uh, and the person whose name is most associated with this idea is Jürgen Habermas, the mostly 20th century uh, philosopher and historian, but um, he's still alive today. Um, he came up with this idea in the 1960s, uh, which was an interesting moment in the history of media and information technology. There were these new media appearing actually in the mid-century, radio, TV, new kinds of magazines. And there was this question, is there something sort of degraded about these new technologies? Do they make us stupider? Do they make us less critical? Do they make us more pliable to authority? And there were, of course, in the 1960s, good reasons to worry about this kind of thing. Uh, and this is a picture here, a little bit cut off of our dear friend, uh, Joseph Goebbels. And um, uh, so, so uh, Goebbels was a master of the new media of the 1930s, uh, especially radio. Um, and uh, we saw in that same period uh, the deployment of film to propagate, uh, you know, destructive ideas that, you know, ultimately had a strong role to play in genocide. Um, so, uh, you know, the concern in the 1960s that was that maybe you know you know there are a lot of there's a lot of interest in germany especially in trying to figure out what happened in the 1930s to make this like horrific moment in human history possible and uh uh the thought you know that habermas was influenced by which came from his intellectual trajectory which we can you can ask me questions about if you like later uh is that you know maybe there the this phenomenon of uh, the Nazi regime was made possible by a certain set of material conditions uh, related perhaps to the media of communication. Um, and in order to kind of formulate that idea in a more, uh, a more complex or well-developed way, Habermas went back in time to the 18th century and developed the idea of the public sphere. Um, uh, and he writes a portion of the, in, in the article that, that you uh, have on the syllabus. A portion of the public sphere comes into being in every conversation in which private individuals assemble to form a public body. 
No, it's not. I'll, I'll skip this maybe to get a little bit faster. Not entirely clear what that means when we first look at it, and it certainly doesn't necessarily seem to be the same thing that we usually mean when we talk about the public sphere. Uh, so let's look at another quotation. By the public sphere, we mean a realm of our social life in which something approaching public opinion can be formed. So let's think about what that means, public opinion. Citizens behave as a public body when they confer in an unrestricted fashion, that is, with the guarantee of freedom of assembly and association and the freedom to express and publish their opinions about matters of general interest. So, so what Harmas is saying is that the, the thing that he's interested in and that matters to him is the development of this uh, uh, sphere of activity in which people come together in an unfettered manner to solve questions of public importance. Now, what he means by public and by private are... Uh, is not immediately obvious. It, it kind of feels obvious when we say the word, because the word is a simple, straightforward, everyday word. But actually, if we look at a list like this, we see that there are many definitions of public and private, and that they are not always, uh, they don't always map onto each other, these different aspects of privacy and publicity, uh, sort of cultural, political, uh, uh, personal. Um, so let's try to figure out what it is that Habermas means exactly. He developed that idea most uh, extensively in his Habilitation, his uh, second dissertation, uh, written in 1962, uh, often still referred to by the German title, Strukturwandlung der Öffentlichkeit, or the Structural Transformation of the, of the Public Sphere. Um, for him, the public sphere is an arena that is ruled by rational argument in which freedom of expression prevails, and the conversations that take place in it concern what he calls common interests, and that's going to be uh, kind of an issue for us later on, so let's hold that phrase in our head. For him, the public sphere is both a historical reality that emerged in the 18th century and an ideal to which we ought to hold ourselves. So the fact that Habermas is both a historian and a philosopher is really important here because it informs this strange tension in his work. Sometimes it's, it's hard to tell whether he's talking about, you know, real events in the 18th and early 19th centuries or about the ideal towards which we must all strive. And, and so the answer is uh, both and. He means both things. Um, yes, yeah, so it rises first in the 18th century, flourishes and then withers in the 19th century, and in the 20th century, Habermas thinks it's at an absolute low point in, in mid-century, and he's wondering, can it be revived? So that's also, in a way, kind of a question for us. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so Habermas, uh, who was influenced heavily by certain strands of Marxist thinking, as, as actually almost everybody was in the 20th century, and we still are, even if we don't acknowledge it. Um, it really thinks about history as occurring in stages dominated by uh, the, the, the dominance of particular classes. Uh, so, so he uh, is interested in the rise of what he, he often calls bourgeois society, uh, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft. Um, uh, and what we might call the rise of the middle class. Uh, and he says, interestingly, that it, especially in German, uh, there is no public sphere, that that phrase does not exist. Instead, when we look at the use of the word public, um, what we find is that there are public individuals that have certain special powers and also church authorities who are empowered to speak on moral matters. And opposed to those public persons are private persons. And we can see this, for instance, in the writing of someone like Frederick the Great, who writes in 1784, in the very period, the, the kind of edge of the period that we're talking about. A private person, 
has no right to pass public and perhaps even disapproving judgment on the actions, procedures, laws, regulations, and ordinances of sovereigns and courts, or to publish and print pertinent reports that he manages to obtain, for a private person is not at all capable of making such judgment because he lacks complete knowledge of circumstances and motives. And this is part of his uh, justification for a massive censorship bill that he published in that year. Uh, so we see here this strong opposition being made between public persons who are entitled to make public pronouncements or general pronouncements by virtue of who they are and private persons who do not have that right. So there's no sense that there are matters on which anyone might comment. So the question that Habermas is interested in answering is, how do we get from a monarchy in which only public persons have license to speak on public matters to something very different, a public sphere, which is more widely open? And what he says is that it has a lot to do with the transformation of the media system. Uh, in this period, we have a rise of newspapers and journals and, and, and the intrusion through that mechanism of private commentary on, pre on those, those public matters that... Uh, that Frederick the Great is referring to. Um, and then in addition to new media, we also have new sociality, the rise of salons and coffee houses especially. So let's talk a little bit about these salons and coffee houses. Here are some pictures. Um, in the 18th century, the salon was in many ways the heart of intellectual activity. Uh, and there was very interesting social situations in which class is mixed uh, and, and where speech was no longer uh, dictated by the the um, the demands of patronage relationships, the way it had been in the uh, in earlier periods, and coffee houses, uh, which hadn't existed before, were a similar kind of space. But the thing that was cool about coffee houses is that there was really no restriction on topics of discourse. As a result, not just aesthetic matters, but political matters were often discussed in coffee houses, and that and we see here. Um, you know, images of vigorous discussion of people of a multitude of classes uh, in these coffee houses, especially in the coffee house domain, an ideal of common humanity therefore arose in which opinions, at least Habermas tells us, in which opinions were judged by reason alone, and there was no uh, intrusion of class distinction or uh, financial economic status. Um, there's some things to criticize about this vision that are really important, which we'll come to, back to later. Um, so we have these new social spaces and then these new media. You know, uh, these conversations are great, but, but allowing conversation to take place across uh, large uh, distances and across uh, large amounts of time required something different, a medium of transmission, a way to get ideas to large numbers. And that really happens, builds enormous steam in the 18th century uh, in uh, newspapers and journals, newspapers which arise out of these very local things called news sheets, and journals which arise out of the practice of letters being exchanged between scholarly peers. Uh, and these uh, become incredibly important mechanisms for information transfer in a way that they absolutely had not been before. So it becomes much, much easier to transmit ideas to large numbers of people in the 18th century. Um, the, one of the things that the, the important features of this system is that through newspapers and journals, conversation becomes a commodity. It becomes something that anyone can buy. Therefore, conversation is no longer exclusive. All you need is the small amount of money required to purchase the newspaper. At the beginning of this process, of the process of the, this story, this historical story about the, pro the public sphere, therefore, commodification is, for Habermas, a very good thing because it opens up the possibility of conversation. Um, this is all happening in a, a mostly pre-democratic era in which the people are a problem for the state and the growth of the social is a threat to sovereignty. And for this reason, the public sphere is precarious and subject to dissolution, and we see that with Frederick the Great. Um, uh, 
So there's this kind of uneasy relationship, but nonetheless, the public sphere thrives as a domain that sits between public authority and the and private conversation or private life. Uh, and it kind of starts to mediate between those two spheres and takes on an almost official role as the uh, the place through which conversations must pass if they are to uh, to if there's to be a relationship between these two distinct realms. Um, uh, so, so in the late 18th and early 19th century, Habermas believes that this the public sphere flourishes in a way that it never had before, and in fact, it reaches a peak before being undone by the further development of the um, uh, of the forces that gave rise to it itself. And those of you who are familiar with the kind of with with the patterns of Marxist historicization might sort of see this uh, dialectical style of argument in which a phenomenon rises, becomes dominant, but as it continues to grow, undermines itself, you know, which is what uh, Marx believed was going to happen with capitalism in the mid 19th century. He was kind of wrong about that, obviously. Um, so Habermas thinks that uh, just like feudalism undid itself and Mar and Marx believed that capitalism would undo itself, the public sphere also un undid itself because the success of the media that are using that 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 are that are creating the public sphere uh, start to dissolve the reciprocal creation and communication of ideas, which gives the uh, the public sphere its what what Habermas calls its authenticity. Instead of all of us creating and participating together in the public sphere, we become mere consumers. And uh, because of the kind of logic of, of commodity production, reason begins to vanish from the pages of journals and newspapers and is replaced by kind of mere entertainment and uh, uh, unreasonable ideology. Um, uh, so that happens for Habermas over the course of the 19th century. And there's this massive growth of media in the 20th century, which which accelerates that dissolution of reason and the uh, and the rush away from production and thought towards mere consumption. And and so in the 1960s, Habermas asked the question: What has become of the public sphere? Do we still have uh, Do we still have one? Can it legitimately perform its function of mediating between public authority and private life? And if not, then how do we restore that legitimacy? And for him, uh, you know, that, that then that becomes a, a major topic of his of his life's work for the next fifty years. Um, yeah, maybe I should just say that that for him, what we need is to get back to some idea of uh, ideal of reason and rational conversation. Uh, so Habermas's this work is extremely influential, um, although there are many questions about both the historical and the uh, philosophical elements of his story. Um, the, maybe the first one, maybe the only one that I really want to focus on is, is the, the idea of the unity of the public sphere that is so important to Habermas. Uh, for him, there's one public sphere and there is like a very strict set of criteria that governs what ought to be in that public sphere, what counts as matters of general interest. Um, but uh, Mark Warner, writing in um, in 2002 in a book called Counterpublics, uh, strongly challenged that uh, to suggest that, in fact, there are multiple publics with their own sphere, and that can be a really good thing. Some publics, he says, are defined by their tension with a larger public discussion within such a public is understood to contravene the rules obtaining in the world at large. This kind of public is, in effect, a counter public. It maintains at some level an awareness of its subordinate status. And Warner is especially writing here about uh, sort of queer discourse uh, in, the, in the late 20th century. Uh, and if we think about it that way, we think about uh, subaltern discourses. Uh, we can see that the kind of assumption of unity and of universality that Habermas makes in his discussion of the public sphere potentially has some uh, importantly um, uh, uh, oppressive elements. Um, yeah. Uh, 
So while Habermas sees the public sphere as necessarily unitary, real discourse in real in real life carves out separate spaces for different groups. They those separate spaces may correlate correlate with social divides, um, and within those spaces, the addressee of discourse is presumed to share a common subordination with the speaker. Um, you know, and Warner thought. You know, we should allow these uh, counterpublics to flourish. We may now, uh, you know, have some some things to say about that. Um, importantly, Habermas thought that it was important that the, one of the key features of the public sphere was the separation of individuals from both uh, his accidental circumstances and their official capacities. Uh, Warner says, you know what? There's no such separation of an individual from the accident of birth or from their profession. Those are always present when they're talking. Um, and it would be, not only is this a fiction, this, but also we don't want people to talk from some place from nowhere because it's our real life experiences that give meaning to, and, and reason and, uh, um, and conviction to our speech. Uh, so we have to understand our uh, our uh, contributions to public life or to discursive life as embodied as as coming from our particular places, and that does not make our contributions less legitimate. Maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll skip that. Um, so quickly, thinking about how this matters for history, if there are many publics, then working to carve out a particular space for discourse can have very positive effects. Uh, modes of address and standards of comportment can differ across publics, and it may be possible for us as historians and amateur historians to craft a public all around uh, around our work, as long as that work engages the public. Okay, uh, you may want to pause and just like take a look at some of those slots. All, all of Habermas's important work in this domain is written before the internet becomes an important force. Uh, his theory revolves around these two things, a technology and a social institution, these are enabled by print and threatened by television. The, the question that emerged in the 1990s was, could the internet somehow help to restore the, uh, the legitimacy of the public sphere? And if not, was it on the other hand or uh, oppositely the kind of the final step in the dissolution of the public sphere? Uh, uh, so we want to explore both sides of that kind of uh, uh, of, the, of that spectrum of possibilities. Does the internet provide a space for authentic public conversation? Um, and if so, how do we like how do we uh, promote that authentic public conversation and work to diminish the kind of uh, 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 negative effects of the internet. Uh, and also, how do we think about how the internet is run by the state, by corporate pressures, and by algorithms that work behind the scenes? Um, the most important sort of technical affordances of the web are in some ways related to the old media, but they're often distinct. Uh, the distribution of information is nearly instantaneous on the web. The production of information is highly distributed. So for instance, I'm working from home today and you're listening from home. Um, text can be read by machines and so uh, that gives rise finally to the uh, the emergence of algorithmic actors to sort and, and, and filter information. And uh, that has really changed how we interface with uh, all kinds of knowledge. So the takeaway of this kind of whole conversation for us in this class is 
uh, is first, can we use Habermas's historical framework to make sense of the present? So make sure you've read Habermas's text, even though it's very dense, and ask yourself, can I take from this some resource to help me understand what's happening in the world right now? And second, for us as intellectuals uh, who want to uh, engage with the world in the present moment, how do we engage with the particular technical affordances of the web to make a public sphere that we want to see happen in the world? Okay, I will stop there for now. And I uh, hope you're well. You'll see more from me soon.